whole lot with these strikes is that um, we're going to start seeing strikes from other uh, other industries, I guess would be the right word for it. We Yesterday I talked about Pittsburgh, the sanitation strikes that happened here. Now we're looking at Instacart and Whole Foods. Um, I'm sure other gig economy jobs will, will start coming in. Amazon, uh, that's a big one. Um, and, and really that might be the central focal point with Amazon and Whole Foods since they are owned by the same kind of evil megalomaniac. Um, we could be headed into a den- general strike if, 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 if they come together and say, hey, this guy is not, you know, even listening to us. We're not at the negotiating table and we're not at the negotiating table, right? Like average working class Americans are not at the negotiating table. We're just not, which is why we need these strikes to uh, to show that we need to be at the fucking negotiating table. Um, and there might be a giant general strike that comes up because if Amazon is is not going to provide the health and safety of their employees, they're not providing health and safety for their customers, um, then this is going to affect us in a much larger way uh, than, than, than we're prepared for, all to make Jeff Bezos far more fucking rich, all to make his PR department, you know, run some propaganda campaign to make themselves look better, you know. Uh, so I wanted to talk about one of the one of the general strikes that we saw since that's the that's kind of possibly the direction that we're headed to um like i mentioned yesterday i also talked about the healthcare strikes that might happen um you know like there there might be a healthcare strike too so this might lead us to a much larger general strike that might be happening so i wanted to talk about the 1919 seattle general strike uh so this was right after world war one the government had uh, promised the shipyard workers that they would get a uh, a pay raise for their efforts to build ships during the war, that they were going to put a wage freeze during the war because they needed to put all their financial resources into winning World War One. Um, so there was a wage freeze uh, in winning that war, and and they did right, and uh, and it came down to it, and the government went back on its promise. And the shipyard workers were not taken care of. And so they went and they talked to their management and they're like, look, we we did the work. The war was won with our efforts. Um, you know, we helped. We helped in that effort. And I think we should be taken care of for it. <clears throat> and the management said no raise. They were like, there's no way. There's no way we're going to give you guys a rage raise. And the shipyard workers went on strike. So. The union tried to negotiate with the management. The union tried to negotiate with the management. And um, the shipyard management refused to negotiate. All right. They were just like, no, we're not going to talk to you guys. Talk to the hand because the management don't want to hear it no more. Right. They basically did that. They turned it into a, a schoolyard game uh, because that's what it is, <laughs> you know. It's a, it's a game to them. That's you know, people's lives are games to the to these people. To anybody that values money over uh, profit over people, it's. I mean, this is all just a game. That's all it is. Um, you know, really, this this brings up a question of ethics, right? Like, shouldn't shouldn't you be able to take care of the people that are doing the work, doing a, a large amount of work for you, for the means of labor? That's what it is, right? So the shipyard unions basically went to all the other workers around the city and all the other union people and and said, hey, these guys are screwing us. They are um, going back on their word. Um, we ask that you stand with us in solidarity, and everybody said yes. We will stand with you in solidarity, and there was a general strike, which was new in 1919, and it would kind of be new today as well. Um, and there's a lot of history surrounding that, and I'm going to talk about that on um, on on our Philosophy Friday uh, video. But um, people don't really pay attention to the history of all this, so it's new to us as well. Right. Like this is not taught in schools and for a very good reason. 
because if you teach this in school, if you teach how to really organize, if you teach how to ha use community efforts to help a whole bunch of people, if you teach people what protesting and what striking and what activism can really do and really achieve and what it really means, um, then they might actually do it. Then we might actually drive change. We might actually see the, the dynamics of power shift in a direction that is uh, more beneficial for all of us than just the few. Uh, and, and, and that's scary. So they use education as a point of, um, point of propaganda. So World War I and World War II is all about propping up American exceptionalism and not talking about how shipyard workers were fucked over by the government in order for a war effort, in, in talking about how Woodrow Wilson I enacted an authoritarian act to make sure nobody talks shit on the military ever with the Espionage Act, where you're not even allowed to make fun of military fashion. Like, they could literally go uh, to war in camouflaged moo-moos, and you can't be like, are we serious that this is, are you sure this is how you want your fucking army to dress in a moo-moo? You know? Like, Nothing. I'm not shitting on Moo Moo's here. All right. I don't need. I don't need like pro Moo Moo people to come out and be like, "This guy's fucking intolerant to Moo Moo's. This piece of shit." Okay. I just think that they're impractical and illogical, uh, as as an outfit for warfare. They're too loose and billowy. I. I don't need to explain myself to the Moo Moo people. Okay. Now. Uh, in 1919, when, when this general strike was, was popping off, um, it was amidst the people's revolution in Europe, right? Like the Bolsheviks and stuff like that were, were going on. So the general strike, some people feared that this was uh, going to be a rebellion of the people. That's what they saw it as. They were like, oh shit, this is going to be a rebellion of the people. Uh, we can't fucking have that. That's crazy pants. Um, and so the media ran this propaganda campaign that, that the workers are being led down a very dangerous path by a bunch of radicals. Oh, no, the radicals are here, you guys. Oh, man, the radicals. Um, you know, and I think that's, I think really this is the first, uh, first time in history uh, that, uh, that we saw a bunch of skateboarders, you know, because they were, they were so radical. I'll let everybody absorb that joke for a minute. <laughs> now, um, they also called they also called the general strike un-American, which is bullshit, and which is a which is a straight up lie because it's kind of part of the First Amendment. The right to peacefully assemble, the right to protest, is part of the First Amendment. So how is it un-American when it's literally part of the first Bill of Rights that we have? That's the first, that's part of the first rights that we are granted. And you're saying that that's un-American. So it's lies, it's propaganda, it's gaslighting the American people into not really understanding what the, the implications of a, of, of a general strike really is. The implication of a general strike has, has really come from, in this case, um, the government letting down its people, the government going back on its word. If, the, if, if, a, if a governing body is really put into place to help as many people, to help as many citizens of its nation as possible, and then you basically turn your back on an entire group of them, a large majority of them, how can we say that this is an effective government? That's what the general strike was proving. That's what all strikes have proven is that the government is letting down a large portion of its populace um, and, uh, and these voices are going to be heard. And you're going to see exactly how important we are um, to validate the work that we do, to validate the labor that we do, so that maybe you'll consider treating us like people. Not an unreasonable request. <laughs> So all this propaganda starts going around, and, uh, and then you had Anna Louise Strong, who said this. Uh, she, she penned it in the, um, a socialist paper, because all of these sort of mainstream papers were 
um, were, were kind of like trashing the, the labor movement. They were trashing the general strike and they were they were called, you know, calling them all these names and stuff, which, you know, it's like a, you're going to call me a radical. And that's like supposed to be a fucking bad word. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm I am radical. That's you know what? That's pretty fucking cool. So Anna Louise Strong pens this. She says, we are undertaking the tremendous move, the, the most tremendous move ever made by labor in this country, a move which would lead which would lead us no one knows where. So basically calling out that this is something different. This is something new. And we have to kind of have a plan. We have to be organized. We have to think about what we're doing here because this this does have larger implications to how we might live our lives. Um, and this hasn't been seen before. We haven't seen organization uh, on this scale before. Uh, so what she did is she created this drama of workers versus capitalists, which freaked people out even more, right? So now a bunch of these leaders don't know what the fuck to do. They're just like, what the fuck? This lady's what? Look at this lady. Can we say hysteria? Is that a thing we can still do? Can we just say that she's hysterical and, and friendly lobotomize her or something like that, like in public? Is that something that we can try? Is that have we tried this before? Let's do something tremendous on our part, you know, on on part of oppression. How have we not oppressed people before? Is public lobotomy something that we can try? <laughs> they just freak the fuck out. Now, here's the thing. A lot of the workers that were joining the general strike did not really know how to run a revolution. There was a handful of people that really knew how to organize, that really knew how to how to move this thing forward, right? Now, the mayor of Seattle, Oli Hansen, used fear to improve his public image by basically like um, radicalizing the strikers the same way that you saw Muslims getting radicalized by the Republicans after 9-11, right? Like they, you, you know, so, so you know, it, basically utilizing people's fear of, the words like socialism and Bolsheviks and all this other stuff, which, again, we still see all this shit today, right? Like, that consistently hasn't changed since the early 1900s, and even probably earlier than that. Um, and so he deputized and armed a bunch of students to make sure that nothing crazy would happen. And then the army showed up, and then there were machine guns set up all around Seattle to, like, to, to make sure that... So, like, so, so they're expecting these workers to get violent which there's no evidence that they're going to get violent it just like they're just like no we're just not going to come to fucking work dude like so and they're just like this is violence you guys standing up for your rights is violence so we're going to stand up for our rights by igniting violence to counter your violence that we think is violence for it's not violent that makes sense somebody put that in the fucking newspaper So they finally got to the day of the general strike. Uh, 65,000 workers just didn't show up, and Seattle was totally silent. Totally silent. And of course, there were rumors of that Ole Hansen had been assassinated, that buildings were getting blown up, and there was all this violence going around. Uh, but, you know, the, the stuff that I've read is not really telling me where these rumors popped up from, like who started these rumors. And really, if the rumors... Like, if people were just kind of at home not doing their work, like, they were just, like, not showing up to work or anything, um, the only people that were out in the streets were, like, the deputized students and the fucking army and the people that were operating these fucking machine guns. Like, so were they coming up with these stories and rumors? Like, that's who was coming up with them? <laughs> uh, so... Once, once this, these rumors started kind of spreading around, like people got uneasy. So the labor movement came around and they organized people uh, using like older folks and vets that kind of, you know, like they were, they were kind of respected members of the community and they organized them. And, and there was absolutely no violence from the workers, no violence at all. So this whole notion, like even going back to 1919, even going back to the earliest points of the, the 1900s, this notion that activists and protesters and organizers and strikers are all these violent people is just completely false. There's never been virtually no evidence of a protester or an activist or an organizer or striker getting violent first. It's always a retaliatory effort, right? Like 
Even, even in 1919, in the face of the army, deputized and armed students, and machine guns around their city, these guys did not get violent. That's very important to note because, that, because that, that is another proof that the media likes to propagandize this shit, that people in power like to propagandize this shit, that they gaslight you and they lie to you by repeating these, these bullshit uh, narratives that these guys are violent over and over again when they're not. Really, the people that are violent are the people in the positions of power because they're scared. And why, the, why they're scared is if this works, if this actually succeeds, then there will be a fundamental shift in the dynamics of power, in the way things are run, in the way that, that the means of production and the, and the way resources are allocated, the way wealth is allocated in this country. There's going to be a huge shift in that. And that means that they don't get all of it, you know, or most of it. And they kind of, you know, throw us a little bit of a bone here and there for us to fight over while they, you know, stuff their fat little faces. So what the organizers did uh, by with nonviolent terms is uh, they offered dine-ins, which are primarily run by women, um, community efforts to take care of the workers, right? They had milk distributors. They had people that would pitch in and collect garbage. They delivered oil to hospitals. Crime levels plummeted throughout the city if for the five days that this strike was going on, which, you know, go fucking figure that when, when you don't have a bunch of desperate people trying to get through and, you know, just survive by any means necessary, that crime goes down. So when you, sh when you actually take care of people, show them kindness, show them empathy, show them understanding that they don't want to commit a crime. Right? Like, if you show somebody some generosity, they return it back to you. Isn't that fascinating? Isn't that really interesting? So, uh, community organization starts going up. People start feeling better about it. Uh, and Oli Hansen threatened martial law. Uh, he started making arrests, and people started losing faith. Right? Strikers were starting to lose faith. Um, they were probably arresting some uh, some 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 uh, strike leaders, some uh, organizers, some major like organizers that really knew what they were doing. Um, that kind of led the organization. And I mean, this is no different than Amazon firing Chris Smalls. Um, this is no different than threatening financial instability of your family. It's all about morale. It's all about making sure that people lose faith in the strikers. People, you know, but, but there's no, there, they didn't break any rules. These guys are going by the First Amendment. These guys are, these guys are, are standing by their absolute right. And Ole Hansen acted like an authoritarian, made, made uh, arrests of people that was pushing back against an unfair, unjust, unfettered capitalistic system that was robbing them blind. And they were like, we're tired of it, and, and we're going to peacefully protest and set up these community efforts to take care of each other because it's very clear that you have no um, interest or means to take care of us. So we're going to do it on our own. Uh, Anna Louise Strong got arrested for sedition. And then at the end of it, because the, the morale in this uh, uh, during this general strike was, was kind, of, um, kind of sucked out. Uh, with all these arrests and martial law and all this stuff, um, and, and, and there, were, there were some issues with resources and things, uh, Anna Louise Strong got arrested and Oli Hansen became a hero for fighting Bolshevism in America. Like he became this fucking socialist hero uh, or, or this capitalist hero because he fought socialism or whatever. That's in Seattle. That's one city. Um, they could have made it if the rest of the country jumped on board. They could have made it if, you know, I don't know, Spokane would decided that, oh, we're going to send some people over. Oh, you guys are having food distribution problems? No worries. Don't even worry about it. We got your back. You know, maybe maybe Vancouver wanted to get involved and say, we will open up our, sh we, we will set up shipyard trades with you guys, you know, and really show the, and that, that would have struck even more fa fear in these uh, capitalist organizations. So then, you know, essentially, then it, it, this this idea would spread around even further. Now, Winnipeg also had a strike in in 1919, where 30,000 workers uh, went on general strike, and this lasted not a couple of days. This lasted six weeks, and it ended in in um, 
um, and riots uh, that were kind of instigated by positions of power. And, you know, uh, it, it was called the Bloody Saturday Revolts. Um, and two people died. Um, I'll go into more detail of that in fr on Friday's video. Um, so, so stay tuned. Um, yeah, but, uh, you know, and, and this is not the only other general strike that America saw, too, is, is in 1934, similarly during the Great Depression, you had a general strike in San Francisco that basically also uh, had a bunch of violent revolts, police brutality, because they were like, you can't fucking do this shit, okay? We're not going to tolerate people coming and, and, and challenging our authority of power. Just like a, a, a shitty parent that's like, oh, you are actually coming to on your own and figuring out how to do, uh, do things on your own as my child. I'm going to beat the shit out of you. Like, it's just basically that. Right. It's like shitty parenting is what this government's really doing. Um, and that one had uh, better results than than the, the uh, general strike of 1919 did. Uh, there was there was some better results that again, I'll, I'm going to talk more about that and more about whether these strikes work and what they what they truly mean and, and sort of the pros and cons of that uh, on on the on the video on Friday uh, for for our philosophy Friday video. Um, and something else of like, is, is this thing's kind of worth fighting? That's sort of the things that I want uh, that I think I'm going to discuss, but here's the thing, uh, these, this, this idea was really kind of at the core of a lot of this stuff. Um, American exceptionalism and even, even stuff in Win Winnipeg, and just kind of the roots of capitalism, why capitalism is so attractive to a lot of people uh, is because it's this idea that if you work full time, then you shouldn't be poor. If you work a full time job, if you work 40 hours a week, if you work, uh, you know, and, and earn a good living. And if you're a hard worker, there's meritocracy. Right. So if you're a hard worker and you do the job and you're good at it, then you shouldn't be living in poverty. That's why capitalism is so attractive is because that's the idea that's that's in it. But when you kind of let it run amok, it, the, the, the labor strikes are proving that it doesn't work, that there need to be some guidelines. There need to be some rules. There need to be some restrictions. You need to have some kind of ethical um, ethical restraints around this unfettered system that is all based on greed. You know, so and, and we, a lot of the issues that we see in 1919, a lot of the issues that we see uh, in in 1934 they all exist today, right? An enormous wealth gap. You, you have problems with immigration. You have problems with how are we integrating immigrants into our society. You have anti-socialist rhetorics, all this stuff. All of that stuff existed in the early 1900s and it exists now. And there were a bunch of acts that were put into place. Um, Taft put some, put some uh, anti-union acts in place. Uh, even Roosevelt put some anti-union acts in place. Um, that, you know, really, really made people not want to side with unions, that really, really made people forget the history of what the general strikes did um, and how the worker movement um, and the labor movements really helped us progress or, or fought on, on behalf of the people and, and brought us to the negotiating table when, uh, when oligarchs and, um, you know, people that were that were thirsty for power had no interest in in having us at that table uh so these these strikes are important there's a lot to learn from the general strikes um especially the ones in seattle the, in 1919 the first time that this country had ever seen anything that enormous before in one city alone um and you know th just the the fear that you saw uh the community that was put together and really, that's when that's when martial law was put into place, right? Is is when the community came together, and it showed, it showed these people that were in positions of power that weren't going to negotiate, that weren't going to help us out, that weren't going to treat us uh, any better, that we can treat each other the way that we want to be treated with respect, with compassion and kindness and empathy and understanding and we can run a functioning community a functioning society without their made-up bullshit 
that's when they get scared. That's when Ole Hansen put up a martial law. That's when he got violent. That's when he arrested a bunch of people. That's always when it happens. When the community comes together and nonviolently shows people that we can create our own system that is better than the system that's in place. That's what these general strikes are going to do. And, that, and, and I'm hoping that, that you know we are headed in that direction because sometimes it really takes a kick in the ass for people to get it. Hey, thank you guys so much for checking out this video. Uh, if you enjoyed it, please like and share and make sure that you are subscribed to uh, get alerts whenever I'm dropping new videos. I'm putting out videos uh, pretty much every single day uh, during the the old the old pandemic situation that, that we're all that we're all in together. Uh, so make sure that you guys are, um, you know, like, share, subscribe, make sure that you guys are getting notifications, um, and, uh, and, and keep up to date with all this stuff. Um, uh, what else did I, I don't have any live stand-up comedy dates to let you guys know about. I normally would, but right now, uh, they are all on hiatus. So, um, the best way to, to help is with the with the sharing and making sure that you're subscribed and stuff but uh if you have the means to and you can donate uh you can donate over at ramen noodles comedy.com slash donate you can make a one-time donation or you can become a sustaining member uh whatever you are able to do but it is it is absolutely uh not mandatory it is a uh extra sense of appreciation uh, for all the content that will be coming out all of my content will be available uh, For free for you guys to view and enjoy uh, Make sure you guys are taking care of each other. Make sure you're being good to each other and uh, till the next one. We'll see you on the road. Thanks guys <laughs>